cycling and this time I'm going to have a chat with a new sponsor for cycling. Oliver Horn is the MD for Swiss Wellness. There you go. And they just fresh off a, a press conference where, they've, where you've announced Swiss Wellness's arrival as a sponsor of the BMC racing team. Um, this is something that developed after the tour visited your hometown as Dusseldorf, is that right? That's, yeah, that's right. Um, so we've always, not always, but for a year or so, we've you know, really been thinking about how do we reach the audiences that is really as, you know, aspiring to be a hobby athlete. You know, the, the weekend warriors who are out on Beach Road or in Sydney, you know, out every weekend. And, you know, those are the men in their you know, mid-40s who are trying to keep fit and healthy. And those are the people that we're trying to talk to and communicate with. And we thought cycling is just the right sport. And we've been looking for angles and how we can align ourselves with. And then um, through mutual acquaintances, where we met Team BMC in Dusseldorf um, on the first um, stage of the Tour de France. And, um, and here we are. Yeah, uh, sort of nine months later, and um, we're the vitamin supplements and mineral sponsor, and we're just excited. It looks like you invest an enormous amount in media. <coughs> There's um, Olympic sponsorship yeah. arrangements and a whole raft of different associations. How does cycling fit into that scale of? immense uh, coverage yeah so we we are absolutely we love communicating with our consumers and we're big investors um, in bringing our message you know to the people our message is um, making millions of people healthy and happier and we're trying to do that through movement mindfulness and nutrition and so for us the movement aspect and the nutrition aspect is really well captured in the sport of cycling and so if you combine this aspect about, you know, being in the moment, being mindful about what you do when you're in a bike ride, it's almost like a bit therapeutic. The aspect of nutrition that you need to have, you know, when you want to go for the three, four hour ride, you know, and not hit the wall, as they say, you know, and then the aspect of movement, this constant training, you know, um, the cardiovascular exercise that you do in cycling, all those things you find in cycling. Yeah, and that's why we you know, want to get so heavily into, into cycling because it's a mass participation sport. Unlike you know, other media um, entities where we really partner with and invest, you know, which are a lot about spreading the message and branding, this is much, is much more about mass participation. Mm -hmm. um, if you go onto a football field, you know, the AFL for example, yes, you have eyeballs, people who view it. But how many people are really participating that are in our target audience, you know, the 30, 40, 50 year olds? Mm -hmm. Not that many. Whereas in cycling, it's almost the other way around. You've got many more people who participate, who enjoy it every day, mm -hmm. but it's actually the eyeballs are almost missing. And so we're trying to balance the, the two, the actual grassroots engagement, you know, in being in the moment when the product is really needed and consumed compared to this advertising message which reaches eyeballs. Yes, I think the perfect example, let's throw one of the products into the mix, magnesium. Yes. You know, if once you have a cramp on the bike and you don't know if oh. you can unclip from the pedal, and yeah. you're sitting there close to tears, yeah. then you're just you're, you're begging someone to tell you what the solution is. I, yeah. <laughs> I've had exactly that situation where I had to stop a fellow rider to uncramp my calf because it was so painful and I was swearing and effing and blinding because and I didn't take magnesium. You're absolutely right. Yeah. cycling become appealing and when and and was there a moment where you hesitated like for example in December when you must yeah. have been close to sealing this accord with BMC and then Froome's bombshell hit mm -hmm. did you feel some hesitation because of that potential of negativity um look we are we are really well aware about the controversy that surrounds uh, cycling yeah but we believe that you know team BMC and the sport you know yeah has you really cleaned up and it's a good time to invest in cycling and the reason to invest in it is actually to propagate a really good message about health and well-being and you know we wouldn't have done it if we wouldn't believe you know it's the right thing to do for us um, look you got in every kind of sports you got bad eggs yeah I think that is that's is unnegotiable everybody cheats whether it's your exams at school you know there will be a cheat in a classroom you know whether it's at work whether it's in a sport and so you can't avoid that this human nature um, do I think it's symptomatic for the sport? Absolutely not. And because it's not, that's why we're happy to you know, support it. You know? And I think we support it to spread a greater message. We want to get people involved in the sports and get healthier and happier. You know? And we think that it's, 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 an, um, it's not a challenge you know, that you know, we need to be 
um, highlighting to the extent that we want to partake and, and support the sport. As someone who's backed the Olympic Games with commercial reasoning yeah. behind it, commercial logic, how do you see the... What, what, what's the, the best way to, to fund the future um, of sport? Is it to chase Olympic gold and then inspire the children or is it to... You, uh, yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm it's a, for grassroots. I, I'm agree, and I think the grassroots. I think there's the two aspects to sport. One is make it aspirational and create heroes for the youth that's coming up. Yeah, yeah, and I think that's where Australia has been really good at. But I give you an example. I was in London 2012 when the Olympics started, and you know, UK and England and you know the whole Commonwealth has invested really heavily in making them a success. And years after. 13, 14, 15, participation in Olympic sports just soared through, through the UK. I mean, you've never seen so many cyclists out in Box Hill in, in London okay. as you've seen after 2012. So I've seen the impact that an, an Olympic um, event has in your home country on local sports because it creates aspirations. Your kids, your family, they sit on the sideline, they witness it, and it sets dreams in people's minds. And I think if you create dreams, you create aspirations and you give people a real purpose in life. And so I think that's, that's the one thing. So that's about capturing hearts and minds. And then there's the other piece about governments and local communities create actually, you know, the opportunity to partake. Mm -hmm. Because one is having the dream and the aspiration, but there's also the football fields, the racetracks, you know, the sports clubs. And then I think where funding into that is, is just really important, but systematic funding, you know, where, you know, even in the remote areas, you know, people can partake in sports. And so we want to get into a more mass participation sports and, you know, work with communities and, you know, whether it's, you know, Visit Victoria, for example, to create, you know, that grassroots aspiration. <music> It's a very lucrative market, your supplements market, isn't it? It's a, actually, you know, it's probably almost the opposite on what it has been. Like a Swiss, and it's very well publicized, you know, there were years when we were almost bankrupt. Right. Yeah, we were selling so close to the we family run, um, you know, business really. And, um, you know, we were, we were making, we we're making losses, you know. Mm -hmm. This, you know, is, is actually a business which is only in the recent years you know, has actually become a really sizable glo um, global business, you know, and um, is it lucrative? Um, you know, yes, absolutely it is lucrative and, you know, there's no, um, you know, it's no secret to talk about because we published our September annual results and our profits, you know, and our growth was 23% up this last year. And so it's very public. We're listed on the um, Hong Kong Stock Exchange and you can follow the, the reporting standards there. But most importantly, it is so such a high growth and a lucrative uh, part of the business because we are so on trend, what consumers want. If you think about what consumers' mindset is these days, you know, it's about looking after their health and well-being. You know, there is this aspect about self-diagnosing. You go on Google, you see, you know, I have a cramp, what do I have to do? You know, and people go then and help themselves in a pharmacy or in a grocery environment. But there's also people just living longer. You know, there's also a new generation, you know, sort of the generation X becoming older now, being brought up with a more health consciousness, the millennials coming in. So, you know, there's this awareness about that health is your biggest, you know, your biggest treasure, virtually. Mm -hmm. You know, and so, on, and that's happening on a global level. You know, and then put yourself into the position of an Australian business, which is really well credentialed at being highly regulated, super stringent, you know, on product quality, clean, green. Um, you know, and having a brand that really lifts that and breezes that, and you have a really strong brand proposition. And all of a sudden, you know, the world wants that proposition. They want clean, green Australia. They want a healthy lifestyle, you know, but they want it from a brand which is aspirational. And that's what Swiss has, you know, created over the last couple of years. So it's sort of a, a great cocktail, you know, of yeah. brand aspiration, macro, you know, trends in, within consumer societies around, around the world. And then the Australian, you know, base, which is really considered clean, green and healthy living, yeah. you know, and those three ingredients just create a really, a really successful business for us. Does the supplement market benefit from, um, this sounds stupid, but from junk food culture? Like do in, insofar that people might have a, a pretty abysmal diet and they try and mm -hmm. um, supplement their, their poor intake yeah. with good product. Yeah. Uh, 
You know what I mean? Like, so if they no. had a healthier diet, would your business be as lucrative? Also? Yeah, so this is a great question because one thing that we are really strong on propagating is supplements and you know, do not replace a healthy nutrition. And when you go onto all of our media, the first thing that we do is, you know, you see healthy nutrition tips, you know, how to prepare fresh fruits. So for us, first base is bloody well, you know, get your, get your food right. Sleep well, drink well, eat well, cut out coffee and alcohol. This is our first message because we are all about nutrition, not supplements. We are movement, mindfulness and nutrition. But then there's a fast-paced lifestyle, yeah? Mm -hmm. And like, let's, let's take for example, my kids, I got a four-year-old and a two-year-old. And yes, I know they need to have their veg and their apples and their, you know, fruit, but can I get it down <laughs> their throats? No, it's a fight, it's an absolute fight, you know? And so what I do as a, as a dad, you know, I give them a supplement, you know, a, a multivitamin because I know my son won't eat the salad, you know, no matter what I do, you know. So I either do him a smoothie or I, I give him a, a supplement to help him out. And I think that is sort of a, a good example on why the industry is, is really booming because people realize that, you know, if you travel, for example, you know, or you had a, you, you're working late and you, you know, you have a, a dinner with, um, business colleagues and you had two glasses of wine too many you need to detox your liver your day next day and that is just the reality of life not everybody can live the perfect um, you know nutrition and sleep it's eight hours and so forth and so for those moments mm -hmm. the supplements industry can really provide you know, fantastic gap fillers you know and and manage those deficits but you know the one thing that we spend a lot of time on is saying no get the basics right <laughs> you know get the nutrition and the sleep right and, and we're not profiting, we don't want to profit from a bad diet. It's, it's not what we're here for to do. Is there risk of um, the, the cynicism of placebo concepts yeah. ruining, ruining all you've got? Yeah, look, there's lots of, lots of critics um, you know, out there who think those are natural uh, products and it's unproven whether they actually work. Um, you know, that's why we do clinical trials and we spend millions of dollars on our clinical trials. If you think about our, one of our best sellers, which is a multivitamins a product has been around since 92. We have clinical trials and all the claims on there are clinically proven. And so one of the things that we're really big on, we, we, we need to be as, as brand owners, be self-regulating and be much more stringent than any third party can be on us. And that's why we spend millions of dollars in R&D. So we have partnerships with um, universities like La Trobe University, with CSIRO. You know, we have partnerships for research. We're doing a Cranberry trial at the moment, a clinical trial. And those clinical trials cost between one and two million dollars. Mm -hmm. And you know, you can't actually um, foresee whether they're successful or not. And if they're not, it's still gonna be published. You know, so it's a massive risk to our business. Mm. And so, you know, I think, you know, you can only answer those cynics, you know, by being self-regulating and truly develop a product that is not a cowboy approach to an industry, which can really, you know, help you living a, a more balanced life. Good. I think we're covering a lot of territory here. Yeah. But um, we, I said 10 minutes, we're closing in. That's all right, 15, that's all right. Let's, um, let's just have a little quick chat and in summary about your bike riding. Yes. With, without you having clipped in and understood the, the beauty that the bike has to offer, would you be a sponsor of pro cycling? Yes, I think because it absolutely makes sense to, um, you know, to reach a target audience via a global sponsorship. We are a global company, we're represented in nine countries, and there's not many global sponsorships where you can sponsor a team and partner with a team on a global scale and then execute that and deliver that across the world. Um, you know, a lot of sports tend to be very national. So you, absolutely, yes. Would I have picked it that easily? No, because I'm a cycling aficionado and then I, you know, my friends are cyclists and I know what they eat, what they drink, what their challenges are. And that's why I could connect it probably more. For me, it was more obvious, you know, so um, I think I made the connection quicker than I probably would otherwise. Just to try and get a little quick overview of your cycling habits. Uh, beach road or the hills? Um, so just started Yarra Boulevard, the hills. Okay. Uh, because I wanted to get rich off, away from beach road. It was just got too monotone. Okay. Uh, indoor or outdoor? Outdoor, always. always. Come rain or shine. Yeah. My grandma always used to say there's no bad weather, there's only bad clothing. And uh, I, cycle, I don't have a car. I cycle to work every day. Last year, I took the car, my wife's car, twice to work. Otherwise, I cycled every day to work. Okay, how far is that? Uh, it's 12K. Okay. 12K, so it's brilliant. 
And you make sure that you extend that trip on the way home? I do, yeah. So I know exactly my times around Albert Park Lake. So I have a good day on my touring bike. I do it at 8.30. Yeah. <laughs> if I have a bad day, I do the nine minutes with a headwind. Um, and so I do, yeah, squeeze a Yarra Boulevard in on Albert Park Lake, right? You know, if I, I got two kids, uh, you know, I bed, need to balance that. I call it the breadcrumbs, you know? So breadcrumbs are the things that you pick up yeah, and, and cherish them. And that's how I see like another five, 10 minutes. Yeah, I can pick that up. I don't need to be home yet for story time. So I can do one more lack of lake, um, lap of Albert Park Lake. But there's many things that we do that are, that are peculiar, but yeah. it's a, it is a big growing community. And uh, I'm thrilled that we've got more investment in the sport because that's ah. very important. And uh, look, I'm, you know, what really close to my heart is actually, you know, um, having the conversation with local communities and governments to actually create more cycle paths and cycle safety. You know, I think we can only get more cyclists on the road if they feel safe on the road. Yeah. Um, and as a matter of fact, when you look at the actual statistics, you know, the use of cycling as a means of transport has actually declined, yeah, over the last four or five years, which is quite astonishing because as a hobby, it's gone up, but as a commuter, uh, uh, means it actually declined and so I think we have an obligation you know as a um, as a society to create a safer alternative means of transport the bike is it the bike is absolutely it I mean to the point where we just ordered a family bike a cargo bike where I can get the kids in the front to completely replace a car on the weekend mm -hmm. uh, um, but you always and certainly my wife feels a bit hesitant about getting on the road you know with the kids in the front and mm -hmm. yeah not knowing what's going on on the road we will remove the risk and create the spiritual change that's required and everyone will ride off into the sunset, happy people. That will be a beautiful vision. Thank you, Rob. I really appreciate it. Thank you.